Lord, we praise and magnify you. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, that the power of the Holy Spirit is here in operation. There's no hindrance, Lord, to what you want to do here. We thank you, Father God, that, Lord, we will receive everything you have for us tonight. And, Lord, I thank you that you will never leave us disappointed. Lord, we praise you and thank you, Father God, for ministering to every person online, every person that uh, hears this message, Father, whether it be here or whether it be at a later date. I thank you, Father, that the same power on your word tonight is the same power that they will receive it no matter when they receive it. And I thank you, Father God, that your word is full of power to fulfill itself. And we thank you for that, Lord. We praise you. We glorify you. We thank you for signs, wonders, and miracles. And we glorify you, Father God, that it is easy to receive from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Does anyone need a Bible tonight? <clears throat> if so, please raise your hand so we can make sure you receive one. It's very important that you see God's Word with your own eyes, and you can spot it on the page, and or if you're using a tablet or whatever, that's fine too. But, uh, you know, a paper Bible is a good thing. Amen. You know, when electronics don't work, you know, which if you're trying to listen to something online for the past several services, you've, you've seen the problem with electronics. You know, because uh, you can see everything, but you're wondering, <laughs> what happened to my hearing, you know? Well, it wasn't your hearing, thank you, Jesus. It was just technology that needed to be updated and fixed, and I believe it's working tonight in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. So it's important that you use a paper Bible and, and get used to it. Amen? Yes. Lift your Bible up and let's declare this over. Say, this is my Bible. Yes. By faith, I am what it says I am. By faith, I have what it says I have. And by faith, I can do what it says I can do. Tonight, I will be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess, my mind is alert, my heart is receptive, and I will never be the same. I place a draw on the anointing to come forth through this moment of God to answer my prayers and to supply my needs. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. This seed will continue to grow up as a tree in my life that delivers me from all affliction. I fully expect to see the word confirmed through miracles, signs, and wonders inside and outside of the church. I will never be the same. Never, never, never. I will never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. <clears throat> you know, uh, there's a lot of things going on right now in this country. And a lot of things that if people get their, their mind set on it, they begin hearing that stuff all the time, that they can be discouraged. And that's why it's important to shut those things out. You know, there was a man, his name was Smith Wigglesworth. I don't know if you've heard of him or not. But, you know, Smith Wigglesworth would not allow any publications, any writings or anything in his house except for the Word of God. You know, somebody tried to, Lester Summerall tried to come in with a newspaper tucked underneath his arm into his house. And he said, you can come in, but you've got to leave that outside. You know, because of that, you know, people think, well, he is odd. He is so weird. Well, I think that, you know, his, his ministry spoke for itself because we're still talking about him today for some reason. And you know why that reason is? Because signs, wonders, and miracles took place in his ministry time and time again. Dead people raised from the dead. Some boldness that we haven't seen even in our day. You know, it's a bold person to walk into a wake and to jerk a man out of a casket and to stand him in the corner and rebuke death and command life to enter his body. And he fall down three times. All these, can you imagine? <laughs> can you imagine, right? If you've ever been to a funeral or a wake, Okay, there's a lot of mourning people around, right? And now this man of God comes in with this crazy notion that he's going to jerk this man's body, this dead body out of a casket and speak to it. And can you imagine the response of all these people? Just, just think about it for a minute. Do, can you think about somebody doing that in our day? You know, the newspapers would have, a, have havoc. They would wreak havoc with that kind of news because they wouldn't talk about the end result. 
<laughs> right? They will talk about what trouble this one man made in this, this wake or this funeral. But, you know, he rebuked death, right? And the man came back to life. The sad part of the story is the wife said, not, thank you, Jesus. She said, now what are we going to do with this casket? <laughs> that was the best that she could come up with after this miracle took place. Listen, there's a whole lot, of, lot more of that going on in our day. So much doubt and so much unbelief. So much thing, so many things that's going on, especially in this country, that is so anti-God and anti-church that we have to have an awakening to the things of God. We have to have the church rise up and be the church in our day. That Listen, I would love, and so would you, it's, if we hear about all that going on and we just say hallelujah and we just jump in, you know, we just jump in the tail end of it and we don't have to do anything. We don't have to do all that work, okay? But you know what? It's not happening without you and me. Did you hear what I said? Without you and me believing what the Word of God says, that the same power that raised Christ from the dead lives and dwells on the inside of every believer here in this place. The raising from the dead power that you can operate in lives inside you right now. The one who does miracles, signs, and wonders lives inside you right now. Just like Jesus said, it's not I who does the work, but the Father in me. Amen. We're not taking the credit for all the goodness that God is doing. He's doing it, but with our cooperation. Are you ready to cooperate? Amen. Come on, Pastor. Hallelujah. I just figured since he was already preaching my message, I'd let him finish. So I was going to tell you about Smith Wigglesworth, but he, I guess he's setting up my service. So let's just take that as Minister Curtis is just setting up my service. Hallelujah. Lord, we worship you. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. We thank you because he is the reveal, revealer of truth. We thank you because he provides us with direction, instruction, correction. And Father, I thank you that when I speak, I will speak as the oracles of God. That as I minister, I will do it with the ability that you supply. That in all things, that you alone are glorified. Father, I declare by faith that this service is milk to some. It is meat to others. And all are fed with knowledge and with understanding. That at the end of this service, we will be in a deeper revelation of the truth that we will be in deeper intimacy with you and that we will live out the truths that you reveal to our hearts. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So right along those lines, let's go to um, Hebrews chapter 10. And um, we're going to start in um, verse 35. You know, there is so much truth, and, and I, the reason why I was going to talk about um, Smith Wigglesworth is I had recently been, um, I had recently had heard that again about him, and the miracles that he walked in were um, uncommon to us, not uncommon for, uncommon for the word, but uncommon to us. And the reason why it's uncommon to us is because we don't take the time to set everything aside and focus solely on truth. There's a lot of distractions. And we can't really, we can't really blame the day and age that we live in because no matter what day and age you lived in, there were distractions, right? Ours are just different. Ours just are more technology-based or more, you know, we have... Everybody's got a cell phone in their hand 24 hours a day. We all have um, access to instantaneous news and things like that. But think about 200 years ago. So maybe they didn't have those same distractions. But don't you think it was distracting trying to read without light? <laughs> I mean, w when were they reading their Bible? And I don't know about you, but I've tried to read by candlelight. That's annoying. <laughs> you know, the little flicker that's happening and stuff. And so... 
that would be that would be distracting for me, right? And so, or you know, your 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 animals are mooing and neighing and want to be fed, and you're like, hey, I'm just trying to read my Bible, and they're like, I don't care. Um, not only that, but a lot of people lived in like one bedroom houses, so whatever your size your tribe was, everybody was bundled up together. And so our distractions are just different. And we try to say, well, you know, oh, well, you know, there's just, I can't help it. Life's so fast paced. It is. But understand, we determine our pace. And I know that because there have been several occasions throughout the years where things have come to a screeching halt, right? Sometimes it's a loved one's health or yeah, one time it was my health and you know different things that happen and things come to a screeching halt and you reevaluate your priorities and you realize that the pace that you set that you allowed yourself to get it okay when I met Pastor Kurt he has a 2002 Thunderbird it is beautiful for sure the thing is it's a V8 and it's a small car. So it goes fast. And I would love to tell any law enforcement officer that were to stop me, I can't help it. <laughs> it's just a fast car. However, I set the pace, right? Because if my foot is that filled with lead, I could put on cruise control. It's just fun for it to go that fast, that's all. I'm sure my insurance agent is not watching, so we're okay. <laughs> right? I mean, it's fun. But the thing is, you set the pace regardless of the circumstances. And you have the opportunity to make the choice as to what we're prioritizing, right? Okay, so anyway, let's get to the word. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. We're going to go all the way through 39. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and not tarry. He won't be late. Now the just shall live by faith. Anybody ever hear that before? The just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. That's pretty severe. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but for those who believe to the saving of the soul. Okay, so let's go back to this. The just shall walk by faith. So who's the just? What, what's another way of saying the just? The people who have been justified. So who has been justified? Those who have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ have been justified, right? right? We are just men in Christ. So we have been justified because Jesus has paid for our justification, right? So then we're being told, so the just, so we all just said that was us, the just shall walk by faith. Well, it, when, we, when we're told the just shall walk by faith, it's extremely specific to us so that we will understand we're not to walk by our circumstances. We're not to walk by the doctor's report. We're not to walk by the bank account. We're not to... Now, do those things try to get our attention? Has your body ever talked to you? Have you, have you ever sat there and struggled with symptoms that you know you shouldn't have the symptoms because you're the redeemed of the Lord and you say so, and yet the symptoms are trespassing and they've just become squatters, yeah. right? And that's what we need to understand is that, you know, and th uh, this, is, this is one of those phrases that I use a lot, is that sickness and disease is a squatter, right? Yeah, but there's squatters' rights. No, not in the kingdom of God, right? There might be squatters' rights within states or something like that, but definitely not in the kingdom of God. And so we have, to, we have to evict those symptoms. So here's the problem. The problem is the symptoms speak louder to us than the word, right? 
you, you can judge yourself, right? You can judge yourself and say, how much time do I spend reading the side effects of the prescription medication I've been given compared to the amount of time that I spend reading the word? Okay, because that fine print is much more difficult to read even than small print Bibles. And yet we will, we will try to find out, okay, what is it I need? And, and listen, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying stick your head in the sand, okay? I'm not saying that because what, I, I mean, if I were to read the side effects, I would, I would understand that the reason why you're doing that is so that you know what to notice, right? If something were to go wrong. And I'll give you an example. When I was, when I was in a, uh, the car wreck that changed my life forever, um, I had to have uh, emergency surgery. It was exploratory surgery. They removed my spleen, and like I was bruised from head to toe. Um, and so, and we were in Atlanta, and I was not allowed to come home because I couldn't get on an airplane, and I needed to stay close to the hospital and things. So, mom came up, and we were in a little efficiency hotel room, and she would tell me I had to walk. You have to walk, you have to walk, you have to walk. And anybody who's had surgery knows you have to walk. But I couldn't, no matter what, I, could not, I couldn't get 10 feet without being completely and utterly out of breath. And so I, I said to my mom, I'm like, I just can't. And she's like, you have to. And I said, you don't understand, I can't breathe. So anyway, she calls the doctor's office. So the doctor's office says, oh, well, what pain meds are she on? And so they, my mom tells the doctor what pain medication I'm on. Oh, shortness of breath is just a side effect of the pain medication, okay? Which sounds fine, except for that's not what was wrong with me. So by the grace of God, something else went wrong, and I ended up back in the emergency room where when they finally did a scan, they found out that I had the same amount of fluid as a Coke can inside my pulmonary sac in my lung. That's why I couldn't breathe. So from that day to this, I refuse to take pain medication because at least I know that if something's not right, now this is me, I'm not talking about for you. If something's not right in my body, nobody can say, oh, well, that's a side effect of something. You understand what I'm saying? That's where my mindset towards this came, was from my experience where if something else hadn't gone wrong, my lung could have collapsed, right? And I wasn't walking with the Lord. I didn't know anything about anything that you all know. And I'm just ch telling you that from me, I can understand why somebody would want to read the side effects. However, sometimes we dismiss truth because of what we read. And that could be true of a doctor's report. You get a doctor's report. Well, yeah, but what am I supposed to believe? The, the doctor's saying this, or it's irreversible, or it's whatever. You know what's irreversible? whatever you accept as, as irreversible because nothing's irreversible. You know, all things are possible to him who believes. Yeah, but I know people who believe that way and they died. Then don't do it their way, right? Find, find people like Smith Wigglesworth, right? Or, or Charles Capps or... Um, you know, Brother Hagen went home to be the Lord, with the Lord at 87, but that was because he chose to. He was like, ah, I'm done. Guys, I'm going home. Right? And there's so many people who did it that way. You don't have to die because you're sick. But see, we need to do it God's way. And so what happens is we're sitting there and we're staring at our circumstances. Right? Because if you have a fever, all right. Here, let me just talk about me, right? So, what was that, two years ago I was in the hospital? So two years ago, and it was right before my birthday because they kept me in there until 4 o'clock in the afternoon on my birthday. They wouldn't let me out. But um, I woke up one morning and I had chills. Now, it's not the same kind of chills that I'm used to waking up at my house because <laughs> my house is an igloo. So I'm used to being cold when I wake up, but this was different, you understand? And so I had chills, and I could not stop shaking. 
And then all of a sudden, I don't know, maybe like an hour later, now I'm vomiting. Now, Pastor Kurt was supposed to be like on the other side of the world, but his trip got canceled and he didn't reschedule something else. And so he, he happened to be home. It didn't take God by surprise at all, right? Well, anyway, fast forward, I ended up in the hospital. And I ended up in, I don't know if I was in ICU. I have no idea where I was. All I, I was in the hospital and I was drugged. And I could not do the word for myself because I was at that delirious part from the fever and whatever else was going on. And somehow I got an infection in my blood, which was random and never happened before and will never happen again. Um, but, but see, what happens is your body starts to do things, and all of a sudden you don't know how, like, I know how to respond, right? I know to speak the word. I had no, I had no strength to speak the word. I mean, the only thing that I did right, like that, that I tell everybody else to do is, we had the word playing in my ear constantly. You know, a lot of people are like, I just need it quiet. I just need it quiet, right? No, you don't need it quiet. You need the word, right? Because at least on the inside of you, your spirit man's being built up. And we need to walk by faith and not by sight, right? So no matter what the circumstances are, you have to be rooted in what the truth is. I'm the redeemed of the Lord, and I say so. Now, when I finally got my bearings back, which took, I don't know how many bags of, how many IVs of, of antibiotics and, and saline fluid to get me rehydrated. I don't know how long that took, probably a day before I was able to even speak the word and get it out of my mouth. So thank God I'm married to a believing husband who was not letting anything happen to me anyway in the interim, right? But we need to understand that though the symptoms are talking loud, the word is the truth. You know, Jesus said it this way, you know, this is not unto death, which is funny because the guy was dead. But what was the truth? The truth was it wasn't unto death because he wasn't staying dead. Because the truth changes things. This, we, we go back to Pluto was a planet when all of us were in school. I don't know what it is today. They, they, I think they're flip-flopping all the time, so I've lost track. And I don't know, they might have added planets, right? They subtract, they add. Why? Because science has no clue what they're doing. And if we're relying, and you understand that doctors are just scientists, right, with MD at the end. So if we're relying solely on what a doctor's saying, a doctor is, you, you know, doctors are taught to not give you a lot of hope. At least current doctors are taught that. And the reason is because of the liability that if they give you false hope, they're going to get sued. If they give you a grim statement like, oh, this is, this is horrible, and then something just, something just happens to you where you just miraculously get healed, some doctors will acknowledge it's a miracle and others will say, oh, I, I don't know what happened. But understand, they're just practicing. They do not determine your destiny. They do not determine your fate. The word determines it if you let the word determine it. So it's where do you put more credibility? Because there is credibility to be had, right? And even the best doctors don't have a perfect track record, right? And it's funny that it would say, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. So think about that. Don't we want to live a life pleasing unto the Lord? But there's no pleasure in us stepping back and, and kind of recanting or, or withdrawing or, or changing our mind. We need to stay steadfast, immovable, and shakable, right? And always abounding in the work of the Lord. That when we're rooted and we're grounded in truth, that those storms come, we know that we've dug deep and we've built on that foundation. 
Because that foundation is going to determine whether our house is shaken or stands. Because storms come. Storms come. I want to look at 1 Peter 2, 9, and we're going to look at this in the New King James and then again in the Amplified. And this, this, is, this is really that picture that Minister Curtis painted at the very beginning about Smith Wigglesworth. This is, this is that picture of the peculiar people. Okay? You. Who's he talking to? When, when, when in the Bible, when you, he's, when you see you are, who's he, what, what does that mean? I am. Right? So you are, own it, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You once were not a people, but now you're the people of God who had not, who had who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from flesh, fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles. Now watch this, because this is gonna be this is gonna be interesting. That when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. You may not see it until the day of visitation. But here's the thing. People are going to persecute us. But don't give them the reason to. Right? Isn't that what this is saying? Listen, persecutions are going to happen but don't let them be true. If, if people speak ill of you, let it be false. Next. Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. Okay, let me ask you a question. Do you think that God knew that some of these people who are in authority are ungodly people? Okay, think about the very first king that God set over Israel. The first one. Why did he set Saul as king over Israel? Because the people demanded it, right? They wanted, they wanted to follow someone they could see. They wanted someone they could see, which then, and God said, listen, this is going to turn out bad for you. I mean, he warned them. This is not in your best interest to have a king. That is why you have a prophet. I have a seer in place for you. There's a prophet that you can, that you can talk to to hear from me. You don't need a king. But they demanded a king. So from the beginning of there being a king over God's people, it's not always gone well. Whether it was the people or the king, there seemed to not really be a good connect between. And so we're not called to worship a king or a president or anything else. We're called to worship Jesus and keep our eyes on him. And ultimately, the reason why we submit to the government as long as what they're asking us to do is not illegal, immoral, or unscriptural, and unscriptural is the big one, right? Because they make the laws so it, they could mandate something and then it's no longer illegal. I'm not getting on a soapbox tonight, so forget it. Stop trying to pull me. Immoral, well, government's big on that one too, right? So, so what they can't, what we need to do is we need to look at unscriptural. 
if they're asking us to do something that violates our beliefs, we don't go with it. I'm not talking about a revolution. I'm not talking about an insurrection. I'm talking about that our personal stance as we're walking with the Lord, we need to know what he wants us to do so intimately according to the word of God that we know where to stand. For this is the will of God that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, would God, as free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. So it's an interesting thing. I'm going to talk to you for just a second about this liberty as a cloak for vice. Um, you know, we don't, we don't sit here and preach against things as a general rule. We just preach the word, and the word convicts people and delivers people out of their situations, their circumstances, their addictions, their problems, whatever it is. But we were out with this minister, and he evidently had been in um, some circles that were extremely legalistic, very legalistic. And so when he started discovering grace, um, and from his perspective, getting rooted in grace, then all of a sudden it became a cloak for vices. So we, um, we had to meet with, the, with these ministers, and um, this one man looks at my husband and says, brother, isn't it so great to be under grace? Because he's sitting at happy hour drinking. And my husband, and he said it several times, because my husband pretty much won't, he doesn't jump on people, so he just, you know, what you're doing is not going to change who I am, you understand? But finally, he said, brother, you need to understand that if you have to justify what you're doing, you're not free. So if, if you're sitting there and you're looking, oh, it's so good to be free, it's so good to be free, it's so good to be free, then you need to look at yourself and say, are you really free? And, and I, okay. I rejoice that I'm free. You understand? But I'm saying if you're partaking in a vice and then proclaiming freedom is the reason why you get to have this vice, you are not free because you are a bond, in bondage to the vice. Right? Okay. Let's look at this in the Amplified now. You know, the reason why I'm talking to you about this tonight is because last week what we talked about was, was it last week? I think it was last week. Last week we talked about um, being a disciple, right? And that by this all will know that you are my disciples, by the love that you have one for another. And we truly are, we truly are the light to the world. And so we just need to take this from the perspective of what changes do I need to permit to be made in me so that I can be a bright light, so that people will know that I'm a disciple, right? Because if you're sitting there and you're planning a revolution or a civil war or whatever else, then... You're, we're violating the word, okay? Now, if a civil war breaks out, you need to choose sides, okay? Period. I'm not planning on that happening, guys. I'm just, I'm just throwing that out there because we're talking about the government in, within the scripture setting, okay? But you are a chosen race. Why would he use the word race? Because you're a brand new creature that never existed before. Within the kingdom of God, there's not black and white. There's not yellow, red, green, orange, purple, right? We are, we are his people. We are a brand new creature that never existed before. Behold, all things have become new to us, including us. We're a new race in Christ. That's why we're different. That's why we're brothers and sisters is because we are a different race altogether, and we're a royal priesthood. See, so we're royalty. We know that because the king of kings and the lord of lords is our king. 
and our brother. And we're a priesthood because we're called to serve God and be holy because he's holy. We're a dedicated nation. Within that kingdom of God, we are dedicated to him. We're ambassadors. God's own purchased. You know, we were purchased with a price. We, we, weren't, just, we weren't just like, oh, wow, look at, look at what just showed up on the doorstep. You know, we are not stray cats in the kingdom of God. It wasn't like God started feeding you one day and you just would not go away. I'm just saying. We, which, by the way, skills is remarkable for those of you who care. He's, he just purrs at the baby. He just, he's just perfect. Perfect. Anyway, so God, we were purchased. We were purchased with a price. It's intentional, Right? We have the spirit of adoption by which we cry out, Abba, Father. Adoption's not cheap. Trust me. Special people. Special. You know, think about it this way. If you knew your worth, if you knew the value that you have to God, what would you do differently? How would you see yourself differently? What did it cost God to purchase you? What did it cost him? What what of his son? The blood of his son, right? He poured out his blood at the mercy seat for us. So that when our justification was secure, then he was risen from the dead, right? So... It cost him everything. And then we treat our lives as though they don't have meaning. Okay. If he was willing to pay that price for us, do you think that he thinks your life has meaning? He thinks you're special. In in Ephesians, it says that we are his handiwork. That we are his workmanship. That he actually, he actually created us. And then he chose us. He keeps the very best. And you're the very best. That you may set forth the wonderful deeds and display the virtues and perfections. Okay, so how are we going to do this if we don't press in for that intimacy? If we don't press in to know him more deeply, more accurately, right? That's, what, that's why we have this as a determined purpose. Do you see the correlation? That without us pressing in to know him, how can we display who he is? So don't take it lightly when, you know, and, and we, we've said this in different ways, but I really want us to think about that when people see us, we truly may be the only Jesus that they ever see. They may never meet another Christian, a disciple of Jesus Christ. And if they never meet another disciple of Jesus Christ, have you represented him accurately? And, and here's the thing. If you're sitting there and people are coming across your mind who you did not accurately represent him to, because I have a whole list of those people. No, I'm not, I'm, I'm not joking. There's a whole list of them. And the Holy Spirit will bring them to my remembrance. And I pray for the Holy Spirit to, to I, I pray to the Father to send the Holy Spirit forward to tenderize their heart and then send a laborer across their path to minister truth to them. Because there are people who I was not an accurate representation of Jesus. And I don't want whatever mistake I made to cost them. Do you understand what I'm saying? But if we know him accurately, if we're pursuing him, if we're looking truly to know him. Okay, so I'm going to press pause here and go to, to, to what I'm talking about. Philippians, and we're coming right back here, so don't go far. 
Philippians 2.10 in the Amplified, really through 11. It says, for my determined purpose is that I may know him. 3.10, I'm sorry. Uh, Philippians 3.10, for I'm, my determined purpose is that I may know him, that I may progressively become more deeply and intimately acquaint, acquainted with him, perceiving and recognizing and understanding the wonders of his person more strongly and more clearly. Okay, so let's pause here for a second. If we do this, then can we do the other? If we, if we press in and we know him and we perceive him and we recognize and we understand the wonders of his person more clearly and more strongly, can we then display his virtue and his character to others? What happens if we don't do this? Then you're the type of Christian that I was when I was misrepresenting him. You're the type of Christian that I met that made me say I didn't want to be born again. I refuse to be one of those. Which is kind of funny coming from somebody who was born again. Right? So those of you who haven't heard that story, I met my husband, and he knew I was born again because he was not going to go out on our lunch date. Uh, he was going to cancel that because um, I was Catholic, and you know, in the Catholic religion, if you're not Catholic, you're not going to heaven. So he called to cancel lunch, and I, I was like, okay, but why? But okay, because I finally had said yes. That's why I thought there was something wrong with him. But anyway, that, I digress. Um, so not because he was canceling, it was because, anyway. So he, um, so he's like, oh, well, your religion thinks that I'm going to heaven, or going to hell. And I said, well, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? And he said, well, yes, I have. And I said, well, then it doesn't matter what my religion says, because the Bible says that you're going to heaven if you've done that. So he knew I was saved. He knew I was born again. But I didn't know that I was born again because I refused to use that word. Be I mean, that might as well have been a four-letter word. I was far more comfortable with four-letter words than I was being born again. Because of the way that born-again people had treated me, had treated my family. And we, we were mistreated in the, in the name of, well... In the name of you're different than me. You don't believe right. So since I didn't believe right, I was persecuted. So tell me how interested I was in joining their clique. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? We, we are not a clique. We're a family that's ever expanding. You know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like when a, when a, a, a child, you know, a child's an only child, and then you're going to expand your family, right? And then the older child doesn't want any more kids in the family because he wants to be the only one or she wants to be the only child, right? And you're like, yeah, because most parents, the way that they get kids is that mom gets pregnant, right? And so now all of a sudden, another one's on the way. Well, honey, there's no turning back right? Like, we're in this. Or you bring a baby home from the hospital, and they're sitting there going, take it back. It's not the gender I wanted it to be. I wanted a sister. You brought me a brother. Like, things happen in families, right? Thank God babies don't know different. But, but, but the thing is, the, there's so much love available. It's not like it's not like a parent stops loving the older one because the new one shows up, Right? It just, it just multiplies. Well, if, if we can understand that from a human perspective, how much more God? And so we're not looking to keep people at an arm's length or at a distance. We're not trying to say, hey, listen, we got it right and you got it wrong. There's one Jesus. And we need to believe in him and his truth his sacrifice, his resurrection, the promises, right? First, Second Corinthians one twenty. all the promises of God are yes and amen to the glory of God through him. 
right? It, is it true or is it not true? So what's the disconnect? We got to press in for that relationship because God wants us to have it all. He has withheld nothing. Remember in Romans chapter 8, it says, if God hasn't withheld his son, what will he withhold from you? Tell me, what will God withhold from you? Would he withhold healing? Would he withhold finances? Would he withhold relationships? What will he withhold from you? Absolutely nothing. Nothing. We need to be walking with him. We need to know what his will is. We need to press in because the just shall walk by faith. That means we walk by faith and not by sight. I know we see a lot of wild things, but part of us walking by faith is going to show other people what the outcome of walking by faith does. You know, um, there was recently a situation, and honestly, all I could do was just cry. Like, I was just cry, cry, cry. I'm, and I am an ugly crier. Like, it's not even a pretty sight. You know those people who are pretty when they cry? It's not me. And I, like, sometimes I envy them. I'm like, I got to deal with envy now. But maybe when I get to heaven, because there's tears of joy, I won't, like, have the red nose and the red eyes. It's, it's a mess, right? And all I could do was cry. But I refuse to not praise him through that, right? So I show up to church, and people are like, never saw Pastor Terry cry before. Well, it's because you never went to a movie with me or watched television, but... Um, because I'm a big baby. Rose will tell you. Pastor just cries. But anyway, so nobody really ever seen me cry, and they're like, oh, and she's in public. Well, yeah, I'm in public because I'm in church, because there's only one thing I can do, and that's praise and worship the Lord, and sit under the word, and get stronger, and get built up, and put my feet back on solid ground, because it is the only truth that there is. Circumstances change, but truth will not. Promises do not change. And so if you're sitting there and your circumstances are contrary to what you want them to be, you stick with the word, you show up, you put your feet on solid ground, you worship God, you praise him through the storm, and you get to the other side knowing that he is faithful even if you're not. Even if you're not faithful, God's faithful. And he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is not going to change. There is nothing that will change in him. And it's not him who has to change anyway. <laughs> you know, when we have a problem, we're like, God, do something. He's like, I did. I did. Well, why don't I see it stand? Don't waver at, uh, through doubt and unbelief, right? That's why, that's why in Hebrews we have, we have forefathers. That's why we have... Through the whole Old Testament, we see illustrations of what was done right and illustrations of what was done wrong. So we, we mimic or we copy the right and we do not do the wrong, right? I mean, it's pretty easy to tell because we got the whole book so we could see what happened at the end of the story, right? So you're looking at Joseph and Joseph's brothers sell him into slavery and then after he's there, he gets into Potiphar's house, and God's just promoting him because his heart's right. And then Potiphar's right wife falsely accuses him of rape, and then he ends up in jail. And then he rises to the top in jail. He's the first trustee that we see. And then next thing you know, the guy forgets him when he gets back established under Pharaoh. And then Pharaoh, he finally gets to the place where he's number two in command over all of Egypt, and his brothers show up. The same jokers that sold him into slavery show up asking for food. What would you do? Okay, so you know how to do right because Joseph then, you know, he, he, he does kind of play with him a little bit. But then after Jacob dies, after Israel dies, his brothers come up with a new lie. Oh, dad said you need to do this. And he's like, dude, no. Don't worry about that. I'm going to take care of you, and you will eat at, you, know, at, you and your children will eat at my table forever. I mean, think about the way that, that Joseph's heart stayed pure in 
all of the adverse situations. I mean, if you want to talk about somebody who was mistreated over and over and over and over again, we've got a perfect illustration in the Old Testament. And the thing was, he refused to take and have his identity found in what somebody else thought of him. My identity is not in your head. My identity is found in Christ. And see, I can be kind because my identity is not found in you. So let's go back over. So anyway, so we understand the correlation between us pressing in, right? And then remember that eventually Paul says, not that I have yet attained. We're going back to 1 Peter 2. And I'm not sure which scripture we were in, 9 or 10. I didn't know if we finished 9 or not. But you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a dedicated nation, God's own purchased special people, that you may set forth the wonderful deeds and display the virtues and perfection of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And I remember Pastor Kurt always would talk about this, that when God delivers you from something, he delivers you to something, right? So if he delivers you from sickness, he, dev- he delivers you to health. If he delivered you from lack, he delivered you to supply, right? So we need to understand God does not just stop at, hey, you know, we took you out of the water. It, now I put you on dry land. You understand? You, you have been rescued. Once you were not a people at all, but now you are God's people. Once you were unpitied, but now pitied and re- have received mercy. Beloved, I implore you as aliens and strangers and exiles in this world. You are in this world, but you are not of this world. I beg you to abstain from the sensual urges, the evil desires, the passions of the flesh, your lower nature. This does not have to mean sex. This is whatever your flesh is saying it wants to do. Oh, I just want to give him a piece of piece of my mind. You can't afford it. <laughs> Hold on to all of it. We need to have a whole mind, right? Those that lower nature wages war against the soul, right? So you get this craving, and then now all of a sudden your soul's trying to. Oh, it's like, oh, yeah, I want to. Yeah, I, and then if we do everything by willpower, this is where our will can fail. Conduct yourselves properly, honorably, and righteously among the Gentiles. That's about anybody else outside the, uh, outside the family of God, right? Does this mean don't conduct yourself properly among the family of God? I know, it's sad that I would have to say it, right? But just because he's saying don't, Make sure you do it out there. Do it in here too, right? We do good to all, but especially to the household of faith. Okay. So that although they may slander you as evildoers, which I'm hoping your brothers and sisters in Christ won't do, nevertheless, although they may slander you as evildoers, yet they may, by witnessing your good deeds, come to glorify God in the day of inspection when God shall look upon you wanderers as a pastor or a shepherd looks over his flock. Be submissive to every human institution and authority for the sake of the Lord. So do all things as unto the Lord. Okay. And and this is going to sound, I I don't know, it's not meant to be partisan, but I'm just going to throw it out there. About four years ago came out the whole little hashtag, not my president. That's never okay. I don't have to like the president to acknowledge I, that is my president. Why? Because I am in this country, and that is who has been appointed to the office. Let's not be those people. So, so do it for the sake of the Lord. Yet, do you understand? Because there have been plenty of presidents, even within my lifetime, I have not liked. But even I, within all of my ignorance, knew not to say, that's not my president. Well, what country are you in? That's your president. 
You don't have to agree with him. You have to pray for him. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. That is your duty. Your duty is to pray for the president and the cabinet. Why? Because if you want to live peaceably, you better be praying for them. Like them or not. Why? It, it's, that's what the Lord would have us to do. Whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to bring vengeance, punishment, justice to those who do wrong and encourage those who do good service. For it is God's will and intention that by doing right, your good and honest lives should silence, muzzle, and gag the ignorant charges and ill-informed criticisms of foolish persons. Hallelujah. Why? Because we can live a life in front of people. I'll, I'll give you an example. There was, um, and I'll close with this story. I guess it was like story night tonight, guys. You got some word though, right? Um, so... There is this. There is this person who who actively, and it, it like it's it's repetitive, so it's not new. But he tries to destroy my husband, and it happens all the time with this particular person. Like it wasn't it wasn't nearly as vicious in the past as it currently is, well, has been like over the last couple of years, but um, like attack him in ways that. It's weird because some people can get so far and deep into their own pride that they don't realize other people can see that something's a lie. Do you know what I mean? Like they can convince themselves that it's true because it's convenient to them. And so, um, so this guy literally calls around the country. First he flies around the country trying to get dirt on my husband. Now, the best he could come up with, the dirt was... Um, 19 years old, and most of it was 25 years old, okay? So we're talking like my husband had been saved a few years when this dirt supposedly is worth, worth, and, and basically it was he had, he had not talked nice to someone, okay? And he talks openly about how it was an accomplishment to not punch people after he got saved, right? <laughs> So, so I don't know, like, I don't know exactly how this is going to be, like, a blemish for my husband who now, like, nobody can phase him. Um, so anyway, because I'm like, wow, you know, it just it really illustrates his growth. I mean, on, but anyway, I digress. So this person's literally flying around the country to dig up dirt on my husband, and he can't come up with anything within the last 20 years. Then calls some major ministries... To, to deface my husband. Well, he never once, literally, never once um, defended himself. Now, <clears throat> I would like to tell you guys that I handled it very gracefully. <laughs> However, I'm very, very pleased to report I didn't use any curse words. <laughs> yeah, that's... <laughs> Um, I did want to rip eyes out. I, you know, I wanted to be mama bear, right? Um, but he kept on saying, just let it go. Just let it go. Just let it go. It'll come to the light. And then the person who had to order an investigation on my husband says to him last month, you know, the way that you handled that situation was remarkable. And you came out smelling like roses took two years. How many of y'all think that's a long time when you're being persecuted? The answer is yes, that's a long time when you're being persecuted, right? But here's the thing, and, and to not defend yourself, because quite frankly, I'm not sure I'm there yet. You know, I thank God for my husband and the man of God that he is. But what I'm saying is the ill-informed criticisms of foolish people It'll come out. It could be a person in your workplace. It could be a random person who's jealous of you and doesn't like you, and so they're just trying to come up with something. You know, I hate to tell you this, but the better you are, the more people don't like you. It's, it's weird, right? 
Because I, I am not of that mindset. Like, if you are awesome, you are who I want to be around. I want to be around people who are better than me because that gives me an opportunity to, to climb higher and to, to achieve a higher level of character. I don't want to sink down to somebody else's level, is what I'm saying. But what happens is we tend to, our, th this is one of those, those lusts of the flesh. We want to get down in the mud and, and wrestle with the pigs. Somebody slings mud at you. What do you do? Yeah, okay. So Bonnie will pray for you. Everybody else is like, I'm not sure yet. Good job, Bonnie. We're all, we, we all admit admire that, and we're all on our way too, right? But I, I, and, and honestly, now we do pray for that person, right? Pastor Kurt and I do pray for that person. Um, and he's like, all right, let's take hands. We're going to pray for him. I'm like, hmm. Now, I remember the word too, okay? It took me a minute. But, but listen, I'm not just going to lie and be a hypocrite and say, yes, I just love you. No. And, and here's the thing. I, was conf I, I, I came in contact with that person um, back in the fall. And I thought, and I, I called Rose. I was like, I thought I was over it. I found out it resurfaced. Okay. And so, so I literally was actively dealing with myself. No, I choose to forgive him. He didn't do anything to me, except for saying that I was a, I was a beat down, um, lackluster wife or something like that. I don't know. I lost my personality evidently since I got married. <sighs> I don't know what I was like before, guys. Huh? <laughs> but uh, I no longer glow and all this, like weird stuff, like. Y'all know me. <laughs> so, so the thing is, I had to continually put myself in check and bring myself to remembrance. No, I choose to forgive. Why? Because here's the order that I see it. And this is, this is, this is my personal opinion. I've heard some people agree with me. Um, but this is the way I see forgiveness. You hurt me, no problem. I'll forgive you. I, I understand that the blood of Jesus paid the price for me to forgive you for what you did to me. You hurt somebody I love. I'm working on it. I'm working on being more instantaneous, but it takes me a little longer. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, for me to forgive myself for the stupid things that I do, that takes longer than the others. It's harder than the others. Like, that's my, that's my level of, of hard. Like, it's not that hard for me to forgive you. You hurt my husband and now my child. Uh, Jesus will get a hold of me. I promise. He always does. And then if I do something really stupid, I'm my worst critic. But see, we want, we want for when people speak evil of us, we want it to become evident to all. That's a lie. We don't want there to be truth in the criticisms. Okay? The way that we do that is by d knowing Jesus and then doing what he does, behaving the way that he does, having his character. Amen? So... First takeaway is we're pursuing knowing him because we want to show him accurately to others, right? We're going to do the word because if we don't do the word, then all that we are doing is hearing it and letting it go in one ear, out the other, and then we're told that we're self-deceived. And self-deceived people cannot be helped, right? Right? We want when people to speak evil of us, we want, it to be a, we want it to be false. And no matter how long it takes for it to come out that it's false, Rose will tell you, it could take decades, right? But we want it to be a lie so that when those who have believed it of us see it, it is so obvious it was a lie. 
let's live a life worth living because you are chosen, you are special, you are royal, you are a priesthood. God called you for a purpose and a reason. No matter how young or old you are, your purpose is not done yet. Amen? Amen. I love you all. Minister Curtis is going to give everybody an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ, your personal Lord and Savior. Hey, listen, if you guys have not yet made plans to go see Andrew Womack in Orlando, that is next Thursday and Friday and Saturday. We strongly recommend that you uh, make plans to do that. And then that Sunday, we're going to have Greg Moore here at the church. If you do not know him, he's phenomenal. Uh, he is currently the director of Karis Bible College um, with Andrew Womack Ministries. And um, he's, he's a great teacher. He's a great teacher. And so um, I'm excited to hear what he has to share here. Uh, he's, he's, he's funny, but he's got a, like, yeah, there, I mean, he's, he's, so, he's got so much wisdom to share that I wouldn't miss it for anything. So be here. I love you all. Hallelujah. It's going to be very good. By the way, that starts uh, Thursday night, and so if you have to work or whatever, you have time to drive up there you know, during the day. So, Hallelujah. If there's someone here that has never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to give you an opportunity to do that tonight. And if you're listening by recording or by Internet or however you're hearing this, you can make, the Jesus, make Jesus the Lord of your life right where you are. And so if you're here in this place, if you're by your head and close your eyes, and just search your heart and ask the Lord, you know, am I right with you, first of all? And you probably already know the answer to that. But if you need him to confirm it, he'll tell you. And so let's everybody pray this together. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe you died for my sins. I believe God raised you from the dead. And you are alive right now. I ask you to come into my heart. Save me. Wipe away my sins. Be my Lord and Savior. And I thank you that I have eternal life. And I ask you to baptize me in your Holy Spirit. I thank you for making me a child of God. I give my life to you. And I ask you to do something wonderful with it. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you just receive the Lord, if you'll see one of our ushers, or if you'll send us an email to connect at reallifefl.com, we'll send that same information to you. We've got some information we want to sow into your life here. And so if that's you tonight, uh, please see one of our ushers. Amen. Are you ready to give tonight? If you need an envelope for your giving, please raise your hand. We'll make sure you receive one. If you were writing out a check, you can write it out to RLC or Real Life Church. And you can also use the text to give. Uh, just text the code RLCPSL to 44321, and you can give uh, using that mode as well. Amen? It says in Mark, um, how many of you have been reading your chapter a day? Amen? It says in Mark chapter 4, and he talks about Jesus is talking and, give, and uh, telling a parable here. And it says, listen, in verse 3, it says, listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And it happened as he sowed that some uh, seed fell by the wayside and the birds are there. Now he goes on down and he talks about the different seeds that fell on the different ground. You know, the point I want to bring out, a sower sows. It says in verse 3, it says, behold, a sower went out to sow. That's the reason he was going out. And if you were sowing seed tonight, it's one thing to to give your tithes and offerings and present them to the Lord. And that's another thing to sow seed above your tithes. Amen? And so we want to make sure that as we sow seed, that we sow in the good ground. And this is good ground. It will produce a harvest for you because it's good ground. But not just because it's good ground, because later on Jesus explains this parable, and it says the sower, he explains it, he says the sower sows the word. And so it's more important for you to sow the word on top of the seed of money that you're sowing tonight. That just because you sow seed of money without sowing the word does not mean a harvest is going to come up on, in your behalf. Now, it will bless the church. It will bless the ministry, no doubt about it. 
it will bless the kingdom of God. But, you know, God has a purpose for you sowing more than just blessing somebody else. That's a big part of it, no doubt about it. But you know why this sower was sowing? Not to bless the ground. Did you hear me? Think about it. This sower was not sowing seed just to sow, just to do something for the ground. Did you think about it? He's sowing seed to reap a harvest from the seed he's sowing. That's the goodness of God because the seed we sow blesses the ground we're sowing it into, but it also blesses the sower because we're going to reap a harvest off of it to have an abundance and be able to sow more, be able to provide for your family, be able to do everything that God has called you to do and do it well. Amen? God wants you to prosper. As a matter of fact, He needs you to prosper. I was talking to my sister the other day and, and uh, in the Lord. I don't have a, a natural sister. I always wanted a sister, but, you know, I've got so many, you know, Christian sisters that I don't need them, you know. <laughs> Amen? But, yeah. but you know, um, I was talking to, to a sister the other day, and she said, you know, we've determined we're going to prosper. Not just for us, but people need us to prosper because some people are not going to believe God for it. Some people are not going to believe God to prosper themselves, and they're going to be in lack, and they need some people around them that prospers. Amen? You know, that's the right attitude toward money. And so if you're ready to sow your tithes and offerings, lift it up to the Lord, and let's sow the word. Amen? Amen. Say, Father, thank you that you have blessed me. I thank you for multiplying this seed according to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And I thank you that I sow cheerfully. I don't sow reluctantly. I sow with a cheerful heart into your kingdom. And I thank you that I will receive an abundance from this seed I'm sowing. I have all sufficiency for all things. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can receive the tithes and offerings. Amen. Now, don't forget to sow the word over your seed even after this service tonight because it's important that you continue to water that seed that you're sowing. And, you know, we were, Pastor Kirk talked uh, on Sunday. I don't know if you heard what he talked about during the offering. Um, I was in kids, but, you know, I was, before the kids were released or before we had to come and get the kids, out of the sanctuary because pastor wouldn't release them. Uh, <laughs> no, he just forgot. Um, I, you know, I heard what he was talking about. Did y'all hear what he's talking about? You know, he talked about sowing seed. He talked about having a right attitude towards seed. Amen. And so it's important that we can continue to sow seed, to sow the word uh, from the seed, you know, the, the money that we're sowing to continue to sow the word on that seed. Amen? Because he talked about that God desires us to prosper as our soul prospers. And so, you know, a lot of people, they have, you know, this is what the Lord spoke to me when he said that. Is he said, many people have money and they think they're prosperous. This is God talking. God told me that. He said, many people have money. They're very wealthy and they think they're prosperous. And that's not prosperity. That's a result of prosperity. That's a result of the blessing. But to be genuinely prosperous means that every area of your life is overflowing in abundance. Relationships. Your attitude. Amen. Your thoughts toward bills and money. Your thoughts toward taxes. Did you hear me? You know, Jesus didn't have any problem. He didn't say, I can't believe it. They're asking me for taxes. He never said that. He said, sure, no problem. We pay taxes. Peter, go get it. Go get the tax money. The fish has got it waiting on you. <laughs> Wasn't no big deal to him. Amen? Hallelujah. Don't forget, do you guys, did you guys get a newsletter? Everybody say yes. Not yet. I mean, last month. <laughs> I'm throwing Miss Rose under the bus. bus. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Um, women of the Word. There is a Women of the Word at West Coast Word Church conference coming up. 
tomorrow night. Friday night, I'm sorry. I thought it was tomorrow night too. Okay. Friday night, uh, the doors open at 5 p.m. And you can register at uh, events.westcoastwordchurch.com slash wow. If y'all got all that. Amen. You can also register for the Orlando Gospel Truth Seminar um, at, Andrew, at awmi.net. And that is starting tomorrow night. Um, don't forget, if you didn't get your giving statements, please see Miss Rose in the hospitality area. Huh? I'm sorry. I'm just reading it off the paper. After church. Okay, I didn't see a date. <laughs> sorry. Next Thursday. I'll get it right, believe it or not. <laughs> I'll get it right. And uh, the following Sunday, a week from this coming Sunday, is when Greg Moore will be here. Amen? That is February 14th. That is Valentine's Day. Amen? So make sure that you treat your sweetheart good. All right? Lord, we love you, and we thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your great love for us, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that we are your sweetheart. You're our sweetheart, Father. Lord, we wouldn't choose any other because there is no one greater. You're the best of the best, Father, and we thank you for being so good to us. Thank you, Father, for providing everything we need. Thank you that we overflow with abundance and especially with your love, Father. Lord, we thank you that we get to experience and share your love with those that you put in our path and those you send us to. And we'll be obedient to do it in Jesus' name. Amen. I love y'all.